Hi, we've done a few videos on thermoelectric coolers. About 40 or 50 degrees centigrade, and we're going to put it inside of this doer. Nice thing too is the liquid like this methanol can be reused many, many times from the dry ice into the metal. What we're going to do is we're going to... Oh, the steam that's formed provides a little protective barrier. Now what we're going to do, I'm going to put my little O-ring on here, put my little insulator pad, put this on here. We built a thermoelectrically cooled refrigerator and then we kicked it up a notch and we built a thermoelectrically cooled freezer and then we kicked it up another notch and built a series of thermoelectrically cooled uh, devices in order to get temperatures down to around minus, seven, minus 50, minus 60 degrees centigrade. A lot of people have commented saying, you know, how far could you really push this? If you put a whole series of uh, thermoelectrically cooled, uh, thermoelectric coolers in a stack and you didn't care how inefficient it was, you know, could you liquefy air? You know, how low could you really go? And the answer to that is you can't get much lower than about 100 degrees below zero. And the reason you can't has to do with the principle of the thermoelectric device. As I reviewed a little bit in the first video on the thermoelectric refrigerator, the re way these things work is that there are dissimilar materials, either metals or semiconductors. And when conductive electrons are driven by a power supply through the transition or the junction between these two materials, what happens is that the electronic energy level of those conduction electrons uh, changes when it enters the different material in order to continue to conduct through the circuit. If the material that you are transitioning to has a higher lattice energy or requires a higher energy of electron in order to pass through it, the only way that those electrons can continue to pass through that junction is they have to absorb or receive some additional energy from the vibrational electrons near that junction. As they reach that higher energy, they're able to conduct through that gap. And then when they reach the other end of the transition and return to the original material, they have a surfeit of additional electron energy. And they'll give some of that away in the form of vibrational uh, electrons or vibrational energy to the electrons at that junction, and that junction will warm. So by absorbing energy, it cools. By releasing energy, it warms. And that's how the Peltier device pumps heat from one place to another. Now, as you lower the temperature of everything, both the junctions, the entire apparatus, what happens is, number one, the resistance of electricity through the material, through almost any known material, reduces. With copper, it's about a half a percent per degree centigrade. But with all materials, it goes down. In addition, the differential energies between those two different materials shrinks. The, t the energies are going down, but the differential is also decreasing. Furthermore, there is less vibrational energy at those junctions simply because everything is colder. So when a conduction electron reaches that interface, if the interface is very close to the, inter, uh, the electronic energy of the original material, very little energy has to be absorbed in order for that electron to continue its pathway, and very little is released. Eventually, you get to the point that the thermoelectric effect or that absorption of heat becomes negligible. And for the common TECs that you can get on eBay or most uh, thermoelectrically cooled uh, suppliers, retail suppliers, they're going to bottom out at around minus 100 degrees. And so to kind of summarize that, what it means is that these devices work more efficiently and can produce larger temperature differentials if they're trying to say remove heat from a hot source and bring it to a medium temperature source than if they're trying to take heat and remove it from a medium temperature source and move it to a low temperature source. They work better the warmer they are. So to demonstrate that, what I've done is I've built a little apparatus to show this. What I have here is a, an aluminum block, just a monolithic aluminum block to which I've attached some stainless steel screws which act as little posts. And on the bottom of this little disc shaped cup, I have additional hooks that have been placed on the bottom through these tapped holes. The consequence is it allows me to add those stainless steel springs around the edge to provide a compression force 
on a thermoelectric cooler that is placed between the two surfaces. And then to aid in the thermal transfer, I use a thin layer of indium film on each side of, these, of this TEC, which acts like a thermal pad or thermal grease, but indium can work all the way down to liquid helium temperatures. It doesn't become brittle. In addition, if you were to use something like, say, a thermal epoxy, the problem with that is that it would fix the two surfaces very rigidly. And with very large temperature differentials, the differential expansion between the ceramic and the aluminum may cause cracking, and that's why we're using the springs. Now, the way we're going to test this is I'm going to use this doer, and I'm going to fill it with some warm water. This has been heated to about 40 or 50 degrees centigrade, and we're going to put it inside of this doer. I've got two little beakers of that. I'll fill the other one. Then what we're going to do is we're going to put a little temperature probe in here, like this, and we're going to read the temperature on T1 of the water in the bath. Then, with a little thermistor that's been put onto the upper cup here, we're going to dip this whole thing into the doer. As you can see, it goes into the doer, and the heat can then be transferred through that large aluminum block through the Peltier device, which at this point is off, it's just a passive item. And then we're going to insulate this little O-ring, a little cap, and then a lead weight that I'm going to put on top to keep everything nice and sealed. And then what we're going to simply do is we're going to wait for the temperature in the upper part to eventually reach very close to an equilibrium temperature with the bottom. And that'll probably take five or six minutes. All right, I think we're pretty close. We're within about 0.8 degrees of equilibrium. It's going to take a long time for us to get those last few tenths of a degree. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my power supply over here, make it a little more convenient to see. And then we're going to turn this on. And I'm going to dial this up to about, oh, let's say about 4 volts or so. That's a good reasonable level for this particular unit, which will draw about 2 amps at this temperature. And then what we're going to do is we're going to watch the temperature as the Peltier begins to cool the upper component of that uh, metal block. And after a while, we'll see what kind of temperature differential we get when we're starting off with an average of around 40 degrees centigrade. All right, there we go. As you can see, we got a temperature differential of about 15 and a half degrees, and we're using about 6.4 watts, four volts at about 1.6 amps. So we'll remember those numbers. I'll turn this guy off. I'm going to disassemble this unit in preparation of using a different fluid in here to reach a different temperature. So what I'd like to do is we're going to get this stuff out of here and clean it up a little bit. These doors are really amazing. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get some dry ice and we're going to get some methanol. Now before I put that methanol and dry ice in there and do the experiment again, I want to explain a little bit about using this technique of fluid baths for laboratory use. Frequently, you'll want in a laboratory experiment to have a very stable temperature to do some sort of an experiment. And it's much more convenient than getting a regulated chiller or some sort of a refrigerator to use a liquid bath that contains uh, two phases of a particular liquid, let's say water. As long as you have, say, frozen water, ice, and water within the bath, and both phases are present inside the container, then even if small amounts of heat are added to the container in the form of your experiment or just room air, as long as you still have both phases, the temperature will remain fixed at exactly zero degrees centigrade. 
And by using different types of fluids, or alcohols, alcohol water mix, hexane, you pick it, there are tables available where you can reach very, very specific temperatures based on the percentages of the liquids and based on the nature of the liquids themselves. And it will stay at that temperature for a very long period of time as long as you don't have a lot of heat input. It's very convenient and it's very easy. Now in our case, I'm not gonna be using a slush of a liquid. I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that dry ice, which sublimates, that means turns from a solid directly to a vapor uh, and doesn't melt, has a sublimation temperature at atmospheric pressure of around minus 78 degrees centigrade. And so what we're gonna do is I'm going to place some of this dry ice into here and then to use as a fluid in order to conduct the heat from the dry ice into the metal. What we're gonna do is we're gonna fill this with methanol, which has a freezing point below 100 degrees, 100 degrees below zero or beyond that, about 120 degrees below zero. So it'll remain a fluid. And for the very coldest baths that use, say, just pure methanol and you want to slush, you might actually have to use liquid nitrogen in order to get the temperature down low enough to actually get them to that point. They're colder than dry ice, but nevertheless stable. That's a pretty good amount. I think that'll work. Now we're going to add some methanol to this. That's kind of fun, isn't it? <laughs> And unlike when you add water to dry ice, which causes it to freeze right around the dry ice and actually provides a little insulating shell, this doesn't. It remains a liquid. And we're going to get into that because it's actually a very important feature of these baths. Something you got to be careful about. Makes me look like a mad scientist, doesn't it? Nice thing too is the liquid like this methanol can be reused many, many times as soon as the dry ice evaporates. You just have clean methanol that can be rebottled and used dozens of times, so it's rather inexpensive. Now, the interesting thing about this is this can be very, very dangerous. It's much more dangerous than liquid nitrogen, and it has to do with a property called the Leyden Frost effect. What happens when you take a very, very high vapor pressure material like liquid nitrogen, and you were to put your hand in it or you were to spill it on yourself, as I almost did here, the liquid nitrogen evaporates almost instantly on contact with the, re with the warm surface and provides a gas barrier that surrounds your skin or your, your clothes and insulates you from the heat removal that the liquid phase would be able to remove from your, your skin. And so therefore, it's not that dangerous. And you'll even see some YouTube people dipping their hands into liquid nitrogen. You think, oh, they're crazy. Well, they're just better informed. As an example, I've got this little hot pan over here. And what I've done is I've brought it up to about 400 degrees, this cast iron pan. And if I put a little bit of water in there, you'll see what happens. See how the water just dances around on the surface? It doesn't seem to actually get, make any contact with the surface. And the reason for that is because the steam that's formed provides a little protective barrier and they actually the water will last longer in that form than if it were cooler and it didn't form that steam barrier, which is kind of an interesting you know, counterintuitive fact. Now in this case, because the methanol does not evaporate at skin temperature, if I were to put my hand in this, it's almost certain that I would develop frostbite because of the fact that the cold methanol, even though it's 100 degrees warmer than liquid nitrogen, would make liquid contact with my skin and would pull the heat out faster than I could pull my hand out of it. So you have to be very careful when you're dealing with these, these fluid baths. Now what we're going to do, if you come around with your camera, you can sort of see what's going to happen to the temperature here. Right now, this is still kind of warm because it was insulated and that's the T2 bottom temperature. But the top has already dropped down to room temperature at around 19 degrees. We're going to go ahead and we're going to put this cold plate in here and it may do a little bit of boiling so I've got to be a little careful as I drop this in. But if it doesn't get too bad, we'll start to sink it and we'll get it to rest all the way down into there. Oop! As I said, you got to be careful with this. I probably should be wearing some gloves. It's a little stupid. I'll just be very, very careful because I don't want to step away at this point. Oop, it's going to go crazy. 
I'm not going to touch that for a little while and let it warm up. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to put my little O-ring on here, put my little insulator pad, put this on here, and then what we're going to do is we're going to watch the temperature on those two T1, which represents the temperature in the bath, and T2, which represents the temperature in the upper cup. And again, we're going to wait till we get to an equilibrium temperature before we try the Peltier and see how we can pump heat at that much lower temperature. A little mistake I made, I actually failed to put this in here. Now you can see how much more quickly T1 has dropped down. And we're going to be looking for that to get down to about minus 78 degrees. And that will take a couple minutes. Okay, so you can see temperature right here is just about equilibrium. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on the power supply and because the resistance goes way down with a decrease in the uh, temperature, I have to adjust the driving voltage down to get us to about approximately 6.4 watts. So that's just about, hmm, about there. So it's about the same amount of power, 2.7 or 2.8 times 2.5. It's about 6.4 watts. And we're going to see how much colder we can get T2 than T1, which is the bath temperature. And we'll see if there is an ability to get to that same 15 degree temperature differential at this much lower global temperature. Now I've get, given this a few minutes and you can see we get about a 0.6 degree temperature differential. I'll even pump the power up. We'll go up to about you know, 14 watts. So this is more than twice as much power input. And we should get a little more cooling with that. But again, we'll see if it makes much of a difference. All right, so we've given this about another five minutes, and as you can see, we got about a two degree temperature differential running more than twice as much power through the unit. Nevertheless, uh, that's not a very large temperature differential compared to what we were able to achieve when we were running at about a 40 degree positive degree centigrade uh, heat sink temperature, and we're using more than twice as much power. So obviously the thermal electric effect simply begins to break down at very low temperatures and even staging units uh, which will allow you to produce larger differentials aren't going to be able to pump down very very low you're going to reach a point where you just it's a law of diminishing returns and it's not worth it you need different methods if you're going to try to get a lot colder before i close out the video though what i'd like to do is give you a little hint as to what the next video is going to be covering and that is about a year ago we built these led diy lights for our aquarium and it uh, worked very well. It was kind of a nice video. You might want to check it out. But recently I decided to upgrade this with a much more powerful unit. Despite its very small size, this little light here produces more than twice as much power and uses substantially less electricity. So I think it's kind of a nice build. It's a little bit cleaner. So if you are interested in that subject or any of the other subjects that we cover, you might want to check around the channel and see if something catches your interest. I want to thank you very much for watching, and I really would appreciate it if you subscribe and help us grow this channel. So I wish you a wonderful afternoon. You take care.